seems to have been a kind of renaissance. Uh, what makes a sudden innovation? What with the figured pots? Yes, from going from ge geometry, which is sort of making a utilitarian vessel quite nice, to yeah. suddenly a work of art and something that's developed and so innovative. What? I think I think language is a big driver in that, and it's it's hard to prove because it, it kind of becomes a chicken and egg argument. But, but around about the time that the, the Delphi and, and, and Olympia are really becoming really big uh, popular sanctuaries, and around about the time that the Homeric myths seem to have been written down, we think, is around about the time we start to get, we start to see artistic changes. So the very latest geometric pottery has scenes with people on them, and usually funeral scenes, sometimes a chariot, but they're kind of little stick figures with, with a chariot. And I think at that point, narrative was becoming really important in communication, at least in visual arts, and basically the artists ran out of things to, to depict. There's only so many ways you can draw a stick man. And then when these pots started coming in from, from northern Levant, then they started to adopt this and say, oh, okay, well, we can put in a Pegasus here, we can put in a Bellerophon or something. I think, I think it must somehow be connected to that. I can't give a concrete answer, but it's no, just... No, no. Yeah. It's just it's just intriguing. Yeah, it's mad. The lights just went on, it seems. Yeah. This is my best interpretation of it. So, a Corinth was the center. Corinth was the first place, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that must have been because of its amazing trading I think you're right, yeah. Facilities. I think that's it, yeah. And then Athens. Yeah, so, Athens saw that Corinth was on to a good thing. And um, the Corinthian stuff seemed to have come in from, from the northern Syria area and then got out through the Corinthian Gulf as an artery into southern Italy and Sicily and places. And Athens obviously saw that this was a good thing, and, and they thought, okay, we can actually make pots look nicer than this. So they get into it. But it's very interesting, too, because out of the 65,000-ish um, pots that we know were probably made uh, in Athens around this time that survive, most of them come from Italy, which is really interesting. So most of them don't come from Athens, and most of them come from graves in Italy. So, it's very, so very they made in Athens, and we found them in Italy. So it seems, yeah. That's that's the general, that's the, the accepted theory, yeah. And then we get a lot of Italian workshops copying the Athenian ones as well, but you usually tell them apart. Mm -hmm. So, and here's a little bit of pop trivia too. If you ever see a pot, a, a full ancient pot, a surviving ancient pot, not just broken bits, uh, from antiquity is probably from a grave. It's almost certainly from a grave. If you put, you know, if your house falls down, everything's going to be smashed. Whereas graves, things were put in very carefully. So, so and like this, this was some. This is from a grave. So, there's always that question about how representative the full vases we have from yeah. kind of Etruscan graves mm -hmm. are of what was being exactly. produced and used in Athens. I mean, we've got so we've got enough kind of finds from excavation sites in Athens of broken pottery to to draw some parallels. But, but it is a sort of mismatch. We always talk about. Greek vases in the context of things like the symposium, but actually we don't very often talk about them in the context of kind of Etruscan life. But no, we don't even know much of them. Yeah. Well, we do a bit more now, but it's a sort of yeah. I mean, there's so relative yeah. of the ancient world. Yeah. There's a few vases. There's these perizoma vases they found in Etruria, which um, have sort of loincloths on the athletes, and that's thought to be a group of vases that were made in Attica but um, that had the iconography adjusted to make them suit kind of Etruscan yeah. norms yeah. because in Greece all the athletes exercised naked and in Etruria they didn't. So there's yeah. sort of occasionally groups like that but otherwise, so yes, I mean, you know, there's the story that we tell but then there's also all these caveats in a sense that, you know, quite often we haven't got the whole picture. I mean, maybe it's a question I should ask at the end, but... No, please ask, absolutely. I don't know how the teachers who've taught this before. For me, what we, everything we've just been talking about is archaeology, and I can entirely connect with archaeology, but from a cursory glance at the specification and the, and the past papers, it doesn't seem to be archaeological in focus, it seems to be more like, how do they use space on the pot? Yes, Much absolutely. More yeah. Appreciation. Yeah. 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 There's a little occasion they'll ask about the difference between red and black figure. Mm -hmm. right. So actually, the Euthymides one, which is on the spec, which is a copy, that's quite interesting on that because I think there's also this sense of artistic kind of creativity mm. and design and, and and competition as well, which comes through with that one. So that's. Um, has Hector arming on one side, um, and then on the other side it has the three revelers, um, 
and so some of you will have taught this, presumably, yeah. Um, and I don't know, it always strikes me that when you look at these things in books, you tend to see the two sides separately and you tend to discuss the two sides separately. Definitely. But actually it's really interesting because you have this kind of mythological scene on the one side and um, uh, genre type scene on the other side. And then thinking about that balance between revelry on the one side and a much more serious kind of leave-taking, you know, Hector going off to, to war, um, is, is quite interesting. So on that one, we do have the inscription that says, um, uh, I'll around, as never you found us, you know, uh, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's signed by Ethan Medeas and it says, as never you found us. It's the other way around. <laughs> I can't remember which, <laughs> looking at the inscription. Um, and so there is that sense of sort of a, a rivalry between these two artists who are both kind of Maybe, Maybe this is the time to talk about kind of connoisseurship. That's exactly so, what I was going to get into, yeah. actually. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to talk about the categories and then yeah. Yeah, get into that. And so basically, Black Figure kind of Black Figure begins to peter out about 5.30, 5.25 in Athens, and then it starts to be replaced by Red Figure. And initially, you get vases that are called bilingual. So you get Red Figure on one side and Black Figure on the other side. Black Figure, yeah. Yeah, we've got... But shortly after that, basically all the good artists start moving into Red Figure. And it's Andocades, I think, is generally regarded as the first Red Figure and, uh, innovator. So the, the late black figure looks like this. This Kylix is late black figure. The late black figure, one of the, if you, if you passes around and have a look, you can see what happens here. You've got the figures, they're really, 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 really sort of rough. And they've still got the incision, but it's pretty haphazard. Mm -hmm. And one of the big, the easy thing to tell, if you see these dots with the line between them, these are ivy. So Dionysic imagery becomes really big in late black figure. And when you see that, those kind of, that kind of ivy, you know that it's, it's black figure that's been made when the really good artists are probably making red figure. So this is kind of like your, your, your bargain basement this kind of stuff, but please feel free to pass it around. Can so that's what happens. Cheap, then, so if you drop it, that's fine. It's fine, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. We get another one. <laughs> and do you ever see like a revival of the Black Figure style, or once it's gone, is that a... Sort of, sort of, yes. Yeah. Um, black Figure, for most vessels, kind of dies out. Okay. But Panath and Egg Amphora stay, mm -hmm. and they're made for a long time, and they have Black Figure at Theon and their prizes, so... It seems to be that they were valued as, as being like part of this ancient tradition. Yeah. Whereas in your house, if you wanted something for your buddies to see, you want something cool and red thing. So, the example I would use when I was a student, those martini glasses, the plastic one with the sort of neon green handles that looked really cool to us at the time, but now I told the crap. It's exactly like that. These styles move so quickly and so rapidly that, that things go out of style quite quickly. And on that note, actually, we have that first. This is a Panathenaic, a replica of the Panathenaic Amphora. That's a Panathenaic, they're about that size. No, they're quite big. They're, they're, they're usually yeah. about this size. So this or even bigger. Sort of gives you a sense of the iconography. But you've got the iconography is fairly standard. You have the, the image of Athena on one side and then scenes to do with the games on the other side. So not necessarily always the same. But and they go down to the second century, I think. They run for a long time. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it was the, the contents that was the prize. It's the olive oil which it holds, which is very valuable. That's the prize, and the the amphora is just sort of the container, <laughs> you know. So, but must have been some kind of trophy after the oil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they show up in graves a lot again, which again suggests some kind of value yeah. um, if you're being buried with your fine sort of pieces. But do you know, I mean, do you guys know how these are dated then, or how how you did? pieces of, of ancient pottery to get into more of the art. Sequencing is the, is the yes, sequencing, yes, there's a few different ways of doing it. Sequencing is the absolutely correct answer, yes. Is, is it partly to do with who painted it that there are styles that we can absolutely. Identify? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So it's, there's basically three ways of looking at pots. There's, um, there's typology, which is mostly what I do, which is looking at forms of vessels and how forms and fabrics change over time, and that gives you that gives you dates based on what you find with them. 
You can do characterization studies, which you look at the actual clay and how they're manufactured and where they're manufactured, and that can also give you some data sometimes. But for the most part, what will be in the textbooks and what is in almost every museum is a type of study called connoisseurship studies. And this is to do with, uh, exactly as you said, um, um, artistic styling. Does anybody know the, the main sort of scholar for connoisseurship studies? Beasley? Yeah. Do you know John Beasley? Beasley. Yeah, yeah. B-A-Z-L-E-Y. John Beasley basically categorized every, at the time, just about every known red and black figure vase um, uh, and tried to group them by artists. And archaeologists often disparagingly refer to this as eyebrow studies, because he's looking at how you render an eyebrow or how you do hands or something. And he grouped them together that way. And he did that based on, there's an Italian art historian called Giovanni Morelli, who did this with um, Renaissance paintings. And he applied that to ancient art. So he was able to group them. So, so does that mean also that there would have been a kind of workshop type practice? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, spot on, yeah. yeah. So you so often get like, um, I don't know, the Adocrates painting and then the Adocrates mm -hmm. workshop where it looks like them but not exactly the same. But, but because it's similar, it's probably roughly the same time period. So. And I guess it's worth saying as well, there's this sort of, on some of these artists, we have names of people inscribed, you know, um, on the pot saying so and so painted it or so and so made it. Not necessarily the same. Sometimes you get uh, yeah, yeah. someone who made it, someone who painted it. Um, but uh, so in those, it, we can say we've got an ancient name that's associated with a particular <coughs> vase, and then. Um, others that show those same stylistic similarities are attributed to the same painter. But you also get groups like the Berlin painter where Beasley found a particular style that he thought was like, you know, idiosyncratic of a particular painter, but we don't know the name of the painter. So then you, so some of these individuals we can kind of access more closely, others we're essentially doing we just know there's a George somewhere yes, but, we, but don't. we don't know who they are exactly, <laughs> exactly. But, but sometimes you can you know there does seem to be these shifts as well between sort of potters and painters and you can trace some of those relationships between people who work together mm -hmm. uh, and also things like callous inscriptions as well like absolutely there's yeah, yeah. certain painters are associated with um, what you know as callous inscriptions which are where you have the name of um, and they usually are callous in the masculine rather than Calais but so uh, Leagos, Kalos, for example. So Leagos is Kalos, beautiful, fine, good, however you want to yeah. translate that. <laughs> um, and those are often associated with particular um, groups as well, individuals. So sometimes you can kind of form up these, these groupings. But then the question is sort of what do you do with that information once you've got it, you know? Um, and one of the things we do in our enterprise is get sort of how useful this kind of show Because you can, you, can, you can make links and you can think about sort of how a workshop's working together or the particular themes that are associated with particular workshops. But it, it sometimes also becomes a bit of a sort of self um, referential activity where, you know, you're trying to identify something to somebody that doesn't necessarily tell you any more about the pot and there's been a lot of criticism in academia about it because it then also gets tied into the trade and the art market and things that have an attribution like art masters. Things that you can attribute to a particular individual then become more valuable than another pot which can't be attributed to a particular individual even if it's just as well painted or so yeah. Yeah. Sorry, and <laughs> interject good. on uh, interject yeah. anytime you yeah. like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, so that's basically what happens. They look at stylistic depictions and then sort of lump them together depending on how similar or how different they are. And then they tie that. That creates a relative chronology. And then the, the absolute chronology, which is the thing that gives you the actual dates, is, is much rarer and, and more difficult. So the absolute chronological points for for probably what you're teaching is um, the Siphonian treasury in Delphi, which is built 535 to 525 BC. And that's a, we know that it was built at that time because Siphnos is a small island, they found gold, and within 10 years, they built this treasury at, at Delos, and within 10 years the neighbors destroyed the island, so they've got gold to take that over, so it's gone. So it's a 10 year window. There's the Parthenon. Oh, sorry, what, what date was the Siphonian version? Ah, sorry, yeah. 535 to 525. There it was. And then Delos. Uh, well, the next one was the Acropolis. Uh, the Acropolis destruction in 480. 
with the Persians. So they, when the Persians sacked the Acropolis, eventually the Athenians made a big pit, put everything in. Yeah. You can't throw out stuff from sanctuaries, I think. That's correct, Sarah. As is an actual sanctuary expert says. Yeah. Um, I think you can't throw stuff out, so you big, they dig a big hole and push it into the hole and bury it in some sort of ceremony. So anything there gives you 480. So then you look at the pottery with that and say, okay, well, they paint the hands the same way here as they did there, so therefore that's probably 480. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get these dates. And then there's the marathon, two minutes, which is slightly earlier, 490, that's problematic, to say the least. But um, so that's what, that's what they do. They look for fixed chronologies. There's um, Eretria as mm -hmm. well. So basically, when a known event happens, then you can kind of trace it out, or possibly coins can sometimes help. So, mm -hmm. so does that kind of help a little bit about dating? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. But you will, particularly for sculpture, actually, you'll often see in a range of different textbooks different dates given for, you know, and I, I don't know how much the, the specification gives you the answer as to which date they yeah. think is the correct date, but it's often quite yeah. hazy, actually. That, um, and it's kind of guesswork yeah. filling it yeah. in, because if you read Beasley, he has a painter, and he'll have maybe, I don't know, 100 vases and say, you know, this is... 510, this is 505, this is 500, based on how the characteristics look. I mean, you can't do that. You don't, I mean, we don't know that for sure. Um, yeah. He may have been having an off day, or she, it may have been somebody else in the workshop, as you said, so it's a little bit difficult. So when you see those really specific dates, it's good just to be a little bit cautious about them. So and when you see 480, you're almost certainly dealing with the Persian disruption of the Acropolis. The Beasley Archive is a great resource amazing, actually if you're yeah. teaching pottery to students because it's free and you can download lots of images, you can sort through sort of images of particular mythological characters or particular paintings. So that's, um, if you just type in Beasley Archive into Google, it's part of Oxford University's centre for yeah. pictures. I, I, I have tried using it yeah. in the past just for images to yeah. demonstrate the literary stuff I've been teaching. Mm -hmm. And I've always found it's not quite worth as I thought it It's would. a bit clunky. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It, it takes yeah. a bit of getting used to. It's yeah. not. Um, and I find the rather than using just a plain search criteria, it's better if you go through the sort of. Um, it's got kind of index on the left hand side, and then you can click on particular like, okay. mythological figures or whatever. Yeah, because sometimes the, the search criteria don't always. Yeah. But it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's useful from a teaching perspective. I've found it useful over the years to either, if you want to look at a particular artist or contrast one artist with another artist, you get yeah. students to do that. Or if you want to look at something like the Sphinx and see how the Sphinx changes from archaic to classical to late classical, yeah. it's kind of neat for that too. And you can, it'll bring all these things up and you can kind of look at them. So there's a few things you can kind of play with a little bit that's interesting. In terms of aesthetic qualities, yeah. is that just like art today? Some people obviously execute it well, and some copy or don't do it so well. Seems to be, yeah. I mean, so you'd assess it on the same by the same criteria: the comp composition, the use of space, usually, the yeah, depiction of the figures, even though they're stylized. That is much more precisely done than that, although that's got quite interesting facial expressions. Yeah. I mean, I suppose then you get into this question of sort of the difference between archaic and classical style and whether, um, because one of the problems with, with thinking about the development of the human body is between, so the archaic style, so if you on the um, handout that I did, the good part one, we've got sort of some archaic core and core eye from the first couple of pages and then sort of more classical images as you go through, is then... So you can't, in a sense, you can't compare line to line. I don't think you can compare the chorus who's on page two with sort of Dorypheus because they're they're trying to do something very different. So they, yes. they um, that's when you come down to thinking about kind of cultural norms and what sort of a message the static nature of the chorus is uh, designed to convey versus the kind of sense of narrative and involvement in inner life. So there's been lots of written about sort of what happens between archaic um, chorus style and classical naturalism and why that comes about, which we might talk about a bit later. But, but so I think I think within a period you can look at two images and say, okay, these are both classical images and that one seems to be done better than that one and it probably is to do with skill and um, and I think that's part of what's going on in the 
the, uh, the Barge painting over there because it, the, as Nicolaus um, never did, it's, it's because of the three quarters um, view of the Revela. So that's sort of saying, look, I'm showing off my technical skill that I can do figures in the round, I can't, you know, not as well as functional or profile that I can actually show mm -hmm. this sort of three quarter imagery. Um, but I think, yeah, you just have to be a bit careful about comparing things from different chronological periods in that way because there's slightly different, you know, what, what counts as good is, is yeah, changing yeah. as time goes, isn't it, in a sense? Which is also, yeah. I mean, it's also kind of tied up to how we have this material as well because in an archaeological context, you can ask lots of questions about what was it found with, was it from a house, was it from something else? But almost all of these pots that you see, and almost all of the ones you see in, in textbooks, are from museum collections, and the provenance may or may not be known. So, so that's why art is so important to kind of, it's our best mechanism to try to interpret these things, to kind of understand how, how they really work. And that's why, yeah, with, in archaeology, you usually wouldn't talk too much about so-and-so being a better artist or a worse artist, but, but with these, then it does become, because you're asking questions where you can, an artist, you know, yeah. But I think you can ask questions about sort of composition and use of space and the way that filling motifs are used to so things like the borders, um, the way that... I mean, one of the other things that's quite interesting is the way that inscriptions are used as sometimes to give information, but also sometimes as part of the kind of the decoration. So on, on the, the bars there where you've got Hector on the one side, it's actually just Hector and Hecuba who are named. And then there's also this question about sort of how much you... How much do you need inscriptions to identify a scene? So if you look at that, it's an arming scene. But do you know that it's Hector arming to go off and meet his death? Um, not really. You only know because it says Hector and Hecuba, and then you identify Priam by the fact that one of them is Hector and Hecuba. He's not actually named. Um, but if you don't read the inscriptions, I think you can also read it as a, as a standard kind of generic scene. So there's sometimes a bit of fluidity in the way that these images work, that often, as art historians, we want to sort of tie them down and say, this means this, but it might not actually have always been quite that set in stone. And that's just... Actually, one of the neat things you can do with red figure, especially, because pots would have been at least relatively cheap, really, really wealthy people, we think probably would have used metal vessels more. So pots wouldn't have been incredibly expensive, probably. And because of that, we think, a red figure generally has lots of social scenes. So people who are otherwise invisible, like women, or slaves, or men who aren't elite, or kids, are often depicted in red figure vases in ways that you don't get them in the literature. So you get this interesting window. And then if you start to think about across media, if you think about who's depicted in red figure vases, like women at a, at a fountain, then you think about Pericles' funeral speech, where women are meant to be inside, they never heard, all this other stuff. It starts to really fall apart. This idea that you know women were kept away from everyday society, and so you can really start to unpick some very interesting details where Athens actually worked. Which I think is one reason why I've been so terrified of art for all these years. Is because whenever I've looked, it's not I've not been able to connect anything that I was expecting right. to see. Yeah. yeah, and there's a real disconnect, and that's it's a big problem. It's, um, yeah, it's a real issue, and that's why people yeah people like like the Spivey and Rasmussen. Mm -hmm. And Mary Beard and, and John Boardman even uh, they've done interesting things trying to kind of play into the context of this stuff and how it actually relates to what we know about society because otherwise you know the Persians have sacked Athens and then there's a bunch of guys with pointy beards running across a pot and how, what, so what does that mean so yeah so it's red figure especially I think is a gold mine for this stuff because it's it was meant for everyday people it was images that everyday people would have been it would have had images that everyday people could relate to and um yeah, yeah, when you tease out it across media, you really can do some interesting things, I think. With the labels you were mentioning, yeah. and you were saying about the characters, um, so I'm thinking to Greek drama, they often say, oh, there are certain elements of the vase that are indicative of maybe the influence of Greek drama. Mm -hmm. Even without the labels, are there, say, for the character of Hector, any similarities across his presentation, or prior, I would say, that allow us to identify that that is prime or that is Hector? Are there any particular tropes... Um, so with Priam more so mm -hmm. because um, you often so I guess there's, there's two things that are ways you identify people yeah. mythological characters one would be attributes mm -hmm. so if it's something like Heracles is carrying you know, that 
the club and the lions getting all the rest of it. And then the other one is context, yeah. and it's the story. So it's when you think specific about that story that allows you to place it in a kind of mythological yeah. context. Um, so with Pi, I mean, you, I mean, if you've got sort of uh, an old man beseeching somebody uh, on bended knees, sort of holding on to his uh, knees or holding the hand of somebody, then it, it's likely to be Priam supplicating Achilles for the return of Hector's body, for example, those sorts of scenes. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's always um, a direct copy of a literary text mm-hmm. or, or a tragic text, I yeah. think. Um, there's a very good book by Snod- Anthony Snodgrass actually called Home of the Artists, which looks at all the Homeric scenes in archaic pottery and argues that although we you know, we, or we want to make these links as kind of classicists, we see something, we see something else and we want to say, oh, that's the same. But actually he's arguing there's a lot of variety in A, story, images and text tell stories differently, so images have to, can't tell a narrative in the same way, so you tend to either have what's known as synoptic narrative, which is where you have lots of different chronological details appearing in the same picture frame, or you have continuous narration where you have sort of the same figure reappearing, or you just have a snapshot, and then you fill in the backstory and the, the sort of what's going to happen later. Um, so, the, so, so the Medea crater yeah. that I've been teaching for GCSE, what, mm. is that a synoptic Narrative because you've got Jason coming on from the side with her flying off in a chariot from yeah. the top and with the dead boys draped over an altar that they were never draped over. Yes. But there they are for us to. Yeah, so I'd say that's synoptic because it's all sort of happening at the same time. And you kind of need to know the different stages of the myth to, yeah. to, to make sense of it all. Um, but if you think about how would you. I mean, you only know it's Medea really if you've got the sons, the boy is there because that's what shows you. Yeah. That's it's that story, um, but I think the, the other thing is that we have to think about these myths. They do circulate as, in, as drama, but they also circulate as stories more widely. And myths are always being retold. So if you've got a, a detail in an image which doesn't look exactly like it appears in the text that's come down to us, is it that there's a text we don't know about, or is it that yeah. actually artists played with details and narrative just as much as a sort of authors did? A possible they? comparison is the Virgin and Child, mm-hmm. which is produced in many different ways artistically, yeah. and everybody in today's society, even if you're an atheist, you recognise mm-hmm. that motif and what it represents. Yeah. Um, so, you, like you were referring to the prime, you just wonder whether they had the same sort of focal yeah. ideas of um, father, you know, prime, beseech, whether that represented, like the Madonna yeah. and Child yes. represents so much, whether there were key key things in, I mean, a lot of people, like the bad fairy in Sleeping Beauty, you wonder whether yeah. Eris... Sort of archetypes. Yes, yeah, so yeah. like that. Um, so I think early, that, yeah. In early archaic art as well, they have because they can't, they don't know how to represent heroes or myths. So there's there's a case where, for a very brief period of time, at the end of the geometric period, this conjoined Siamese twin motif becomes quite common, and that's something that geometric artists could have used to tell a story, because you couldn't tell a story just from a little sort of outline of a figure. And then in archaic art, wings become really common. So if you want to represent something supernatural, you give it wings, and that's the code. And then in classical art, if you want to represent something supernatural, it's kind of twice life-size. So they have some ways of trying to ground these stories in iconographically, and it changes over time. But, and yeah. is that recorded, or do all, I mean, do all the books that you've been quoting refer to that? Or? Um, I think they probably do. The early one, um, the early one about the Siamese twin motif and the wings is by Albert, what's it, Greta Albert Cornell, and it's published in 1972. And it talks about, it's called Myth and Epos in Early Greek Art. Myth and, Myth and Epos, E-P-O-S. And it, it talks about, it talks exactly about that, actually, which is really interesting. The other um, thing that's quite nice as a text about that is Pausanias, um, Book 5 of Pausanias' Guide to Greece, talking about the chest of Kipsilus. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he actually talks about how he identifies the figures. So he says, you know, this is clearly so-and-so because 
they're carrying a club and and then he goes okay these ones they haven't really got any attributes but they've got labels these ones I had no idea and I had to ask the guide and he explained who it was so that actually is is a nice insight I mean okay Pisanius is writing in the second century AD so he's not coeval with these things but it takes you through the Ident which is more or less the same way that we try and identify yeah. things. Um, so that's in um, the fifth book of, of Pisanius's Guide to Greece, and it's sort of early on when he's talking about the Temple of Hera and the chest of Kypsilus, which is this ancient archaic chest of Kypsilus. Yeah, that's nice. So how do we define chorus and chore? Um, so if you look on some pages two and three, you've got the, the typical um, chorus. This is actually the one that's often known as um, Koisus, it was found at Anabysus in Attica. Um, and the things that characterise that, it's sort of um, very frontal, it's four square. Um, there's some sense of movement in the sense that one leg is further forward than the other, um, but the weight of the statue is equally balanced on the two legs, so you don't get that sort of shifting weight that you get later on in classical. Um, but we always tend to sort of look at archaic versus what comes later and see it as very static. What's interesting is that some of the texts that talk about um, didalic sculptures, so what comes before, and then archaic as well, talk about didalists making statues that moved. So what might seem very static to us might have seemed quite um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, forward-thinking and dynamic and new in the context in which it was first created. So, so Kouros is thought of as being didalic. Yeah, uh, so didalic is actually slightly earlier than, so the didalic statues are from the 7th century, but they share um, a number of features that then are shared by the core as well. So didalic statues generally, um, it's a uh, much wider eye, so they have these very large almond-shaped eyes and lots of, sort of patterned hair. Um, and those features then carry on through into the, into the chorus as well. Um, but in terms of the context of the, the chorus, uh, choroi, um, uh, generally, they, they fall into sort of two main contexts, places that we find them, which are votives and funerary. Um, so um, we found them in a number of, of sanctuary sites, and that's led to kind of this question of what these figures represent so initially, because a lot of them were found at the sanctuary of uh, Apollo and Naxos. It was thought that they were all representations of Apollo. And then later on, we started finding kind of Koroi at the Temple of Poseidon on Sunion and at Hero on Samos. Um, and then it was sort of, well, actually, Poseidon, you know, okay, Apollo is useful, so it makes sense for Apollo, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for a male god or a female. And also, um, Hero at, um, Saint, at um, Argos as well, it's quite a few from there. Um, so now it seems more likely that actually what they are is kind of um, embodiments of youthful excellence, of kind of the aristocratic ideal of, of youthful beauty and sort of manhood at its best. Um, and that sometimes identities can be projected onto that. So occasionally there are some, for example, there's the Colossus Apollo of the Naxians, which has a belt on it. Um, so normally they're naked, but occasionally find them wearing belts. Um, Where is that? That's the one at Naxos. So that's the first of my examples on the, the front of the handout, the colossal um, Apollo of the Naxians. Actually, if you, can you just pass me the, there's a book in that bag, in there, yeah. sorry, in the, in the bag there's um, Stuart's book on the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, well, I might want the other one, the plates one. Okay. All right. There's That'd a nice um, comparison of the, the scales. So this is another book I think is really useful. This is the older, it's 1990, but for sculpture, it's it's really useful if you haven't got it in your school libraries. I think it's probably still in print. Yes, I've, I've had mine since then, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, and it has quite useful things like sort of the mapping out of the proportions versus the kind of Egyptian canon as well. Um, but I think he has. Yeah. That statue is massive. Yeah, Genius. so oh. that's quite a useful comparison. Uh -huh. So the big one is the colossal Apollo of Daxians. And then because you tend to see them in photographs, you don't necessarily get the sense of the scale of all of these things. Um, and so when you're thinking about identities of them, you know, you don't want to just look at what they show, but also think, well, is this life size? Is it over life size? Is it colossal? Because that something that's colossal is more likely to represent God, something that's life size is more likely to be representative of the human, for example. Um, 
The other thing to slightly be aware of with Koi, uh, but again, you know, it's probably safest to stick with the dates that are in the textbooks, but just to know that those dates are very um, loose, because what's the way that they've been arrived at is that essentially they put all of the Koi together and looked at which ones look most archaic and which ones look most classical and decided that that's the order in which they were produced. So it's a very teleological sort of yes. way of dating things. You assume that everybody's aiming for the end point, but of course when people are making these things they don't know that that's the end point. So. No, and also um, there seems to be a difference in, in place. Absolutely. Something that's made in the east and something that's yeah. made from further west. Or yeah, so there's definitely regional styles. So things like um, the koi in the uh, east, particularly from sort of bits of Asia Minor, tend to be much more fleshy. Um, and the, the the treatment of the of koi as well, the females, is much more fluid. So often they are almost like column drums rather than mm. being um, sort of flatter. Um, so there are definitely regional styles, the sort of Boeotian ones sometimes a bit more stocky and the Argive ones and, and things like that. So you get that, that sort of sense as well. Um, how, how many have been found in total? Good question, I've no idea. Um, six, seven, I think it might be up to twelve, nine, yeah. possibly. Not very many. Two were found. Not at all. Very few, yeah, yeah. Two That's were found a couple of, no, five years ago now with their feet chopped um, just outside Corinth, so they're doing an excavation in their cave cemetery to find more. He's got 16 in this, but um, but I'm sure, yeah, I would say possibly at about 20 or so, because there are a few torsos as well, aren't there, where we've got There are lots. bits of them, yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, the yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and, and there are undoubtedly going to be some parts. that haven't been um, published. Yeah. Well. Was this Corroy or Corroy? yeah, the, the male ones. So um, I think that in Boeotia, mm -hmm. in um, the in the Patoion, the mm -hmm. Temple of Apollo Patoios, Ducat, I think potentially, I think it was Ducat, mm -hmm. found about 120. Oh gosh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I think that there are all yeah. these bits. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit like sort of counting, where well, we had a supervision with a student about <laughs> counting <laughs> alphabet. You know, um, if you have lots of different bits, you don't actually know how many whole statues yeah. you've got out of that. You can, you also, can sort of if you, if you have come a up with. Yeah, it, who have the other? So yes, I mean there were. It does seem to have been the standard form of representing the male body um, in the archaic period, um, and we have some examples. We have sort of literary references to Victor statues, for example, being in the form of a, a chorus. Uh, but most of the ones we've got come from sanctuaries or as grave markers. Um, and one of the ones. The Getty as well. Come yes. Things even further, hmm? yeah. Which is probably this a big one. one. The Getty Kuros. Mm. This one it was much mm. bluster. The Getty Museum bought this Kuros for 10 billion. I think in the 90s, was it? Mm. And uh, it's almost certainly fake. But then they did petrography and all these analysis, analytical techniques on it. And it seems to be from the island of Thassos. And art historians kind of look and say, no, this isn't right. Archaeologists look and say, well, it's from Thassos. It could possibly be a Kuros. So, the jury's totally, I mean, you see it, it's either, you know, 6th century BC or fake, as you know, what the label says. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's, they're so valuable as well, that it's kind of an incentive to, yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing story if you're ever bored. Um, and then you do occasionally get kind of pairs, so like Cleobus and Vito and the ones from Delphi, although again, there's, there's some discussion that they might actually be the Dioscuri instead of Cleobus and Vito, and so we've got, oh. we've got the text, we've got these two um, who look like they belong together, <laughs> um, but the, there's different interpretations of that evidence. Uh, two from Coral um, for a pair as well, the recent yeah. ones as well. So. Mm. Um, and then in the funerary ones, uh, quite a good example is the Koisus one, um, who uh, well it's not absolutely certain that the Koros and the base belong, but they were found in the same context. So they were found close to each other, but there's some discussion as to whether it actually is. Um, but the base has an inscription that says, Stay and mourn at the monument of the dead Koisus, whom Ares destroyed fighting in the front line. So that is quite a nice example because it suggests that the the Koros is being used uh, to celebrate someone who's killed in war, but the image, if the two belong, doesn't show anything to do with war. So he's not wearing armor, he's not wearing um, 
sort of attributes of fighting or whatever. So the idea is more that this is just a, an embodiment of kind of the perfection, I guess, of, of the, the human body. Um, whereas the Kolai have a bit more narrative around them, I think, because they are usually in the process of offering something. So the Kolai have their arms by their sides, um, in most cases, with few exceptions. Um, whereas the Kolai tend to have um, one arm outstretched. Again, not always, there's a few from the east where they have their arms by their sides, but they tend to be holding something out, so either fruit or flowers. Um, and they are so the best examples are the ones from the Athenian Acropolis, where you've got lots. I mean, it's bad on figures, but lots. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> not very um, approximate numbering. Um, and those we know are from inscriptions, are dedicated usually by men to the goddess. Um, but we have them also in the sanctuaries of um, Artemis, for example. So there's one, one of the earlier ones from the mid 7th century, um, a Kore dedicated by Lycanda, uh, which actually, if you look at it, it's very flat. It's, it's almost like a plank of wood, really. It's, it's not mm. much depth to it at all. Um, but that, the inscription on that is a dedication by a woman um, to, the, um, uh, to Artemis. And that's quite nice because she describes herself as being the daughter of Danodicida, is the sister of Danodicida, is the wife of Praxos. So she kind of defines herself in relation to her male relatives, but nevertheless she is a female dedicated to a female uh, goddess. Um, so in that one, there a number of scholars think, because there's a hole it drilled in the hand, they think that she might have been holding the bow and actually it's a representation of the goddess herself. Um, others seem to be representations of just human women, beautiful women, uh, young girls. Um, and there's a nice article by um, Robert Osborne on these, which again I've given you, uh, we haven't circulated today, but I've given you the reference on the handout, which is talking about how, uh, it's actually talking about the place of girls in kind of marriage. Um, so the, the ways that girls are kind of exchanged for dowries, um, and that all the women also um, are kind of associated with building up links between particular families, so that the, the, the female as a kind of almost a commodity, as a sort of item of exchange between uh, males, and the way that that sort of may feed through into why the core is a is a useful um, kind of representative to. to um, show offerings to, to the gods. Um, but we do also get some cases where they seem to stand for individual female women, like the, uh, in the funeral context, so the Fasa Claire one that I've given you, uh, again, it's got an inscription saying, I shall ever be known as maiden. Um, and it says it mark her Fasa Claire, um, so it sort of directly identifies itself as being uh, um, something that stands in for her or records her. Um, the gods allotted me this title, Kore, in place of marriage. So this idea of a kind of marriage and death. But also, um, it's probably the best evidence we have as to whether they were thought of as Kore or not in antiquity. So this one is called Kore. But, you know, as with so many of these titles, they're mostly they're things that we applied um, later on to, to the material. Um, but then I just wanted to sort of thinking about kind of moving on into the sort of 5th century, I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of two statues which, and it's not a brilliant image of the Dolphy Chariot here, um, but potentially both date to the 470s, although the dating has been um, dated on much use. But so, have I, have you, you've probably seen, those of you who are teaching, you've seen the Dolphy Chariot here before. Have you seen the, the other one before? No, not? no, I haven't. So any, any kind of comments on, so these are potentially two um, statues, so one in bronze, one in marble, that date to roughly the same time, um, have been dated roughly to the same time. Um, any comments on kind of the similarities, differences between them, what they might represent? Well, there's more movement in the second, mm -hmm. and uh, the drapery is used to expose the body yeah. and conceal it. Yeah. But the hair, hair is the same, sort of or similar. Yeah, so they both have these sort of severe style um, 
heads, um, the, the decoration of the hair, the sort of rows of the, the curls. Um, and yet the body of the, the mochi youth is very different. So this one is one that was found in Mocha, which is an island just off um, Sicily. Um, it's actually a Carthaginian island, but it was destroyed by the Syracusans in the early 4th century BC, which is our kind of terminus antique crown, so it must be. It was found buried in the sanctuary. Um, so it must be 5th century, um, and it's usually been dated to between 480 to 450, and more specifically 480 to 470, uh, because of the face, basically, because the face seems to be very close to the kind of severe style that you see elsewhere. Um, there's quite a lot of debate as to what, who he is, but um, a number of scholars have identified him as being the charioteer um, because he's wearing this long kind of, um, the, the long mm -hmm. sort of ketone, mm -hmm. which the Delphi charioteer is also um, wearing. I mean, some people think he might have been a dancer or a priest, or so it's possible there's another interpretation. Um, but the charioteer seems quite likely to me. Uh, they both have a kind of band that runs across the chest. You can't see it on the Delphic Charity because it's got his arms up. Um, but, uh, so one of the things I think is interesting is if, it, if the much use is a charity, which, as I say, is sort of up for debate, um, is that difference between what could have been two different um, victory monuments for charioteers set up a Delphi, we don't quite know where, either on Mocha itself or possibly on Syracuse, on, um, at Syracuse, on Sicily, and then taken over to Mocha. Um, and one of the, the, the sort of explanations for that might be that it depends on who they're representing. So um, the Delphic charioteer is uh, associated with an inscription that talks about Polyzalus of Gala winning a chariot victory at Delphi in either 478 or 474. Um, and it's usually assumed that this is the kind of hired charioteer who drives someone else's horses. So the fact that he's very static, doesn't have a lot of expression, um, and he's wearing this quite sort of um, unindividualized, very generic outfit, might be because this is a servant. This isn't a um, you know this isn't the victor himself. This is kind of someone who's paid to drive his horses. Whereas um, one interpretation of the much used is that actually maybe this is a charioteer who's driving his own horses. So the sort of vibrancy in the body, the kind of the the energy that you get in this sense, and you get much more energy. I mean, partly because of the the, the position. So for the Delphi charioteer, the feet are together, the weight is minus evenly balanced, it seems very static. The much used, you have um, he's clearly standing on his. The weight's on his left leg, he's got the right leg is sort of more relaxed and the, the draper is clinging to that. So it's a very clear outline of the body, the hand on the hips. He's thought he has his right arm either holding something or possibly extended sort of behind his head. And he actually holds on the, the back of the head that could have represented something. Um, the article I've given you is arguing um, that he was actually uh, a kind of priestly role, a dancer with this, this uh, magnificent sort of headdress. I don't actually believe that, but it's quite a good article because it, it goes through all of the different interpretations, so I thought it's quite useful because it's sort of all the information in one place. Um, so it gives you the kind of the, the fine spot and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it, it could have been that he's actually crowning himself, and that would tie in as well if this is um, a victor who's kind of had a victory somewhere in Greece and then is coming home and setting up a monument to himself. So just thinking about how, who's setting things up, who's looking at them, what context they're set up in, might make a difference to the, the, the form and the shape, um, even for two statues to roughly, you know, in certain maybe between, within a decade or so of each other. Um, and the other thing to think about, I suppose, is, is um, material as well, I guess. He's going to say, with the much more have had horses as well, because that's what Cherry Deer yes. the horses in front, which makes a big difference to you really see. Yeah, that part that's of right. The you. Yes, and so you've got that sense of the sort of almost the body seems to be elongated um, and sort of has too much room for his legs almost yeah. because of that. Yeah. Um, and we don't know with the other one, the much one. We haven't, they haven't found any remains right. of horses, so it could well have been that it's just him on his own as a victor. Um, 
And I, as I say, you know, it's possible he's not a charity at all, but the context of being in a sanctuary does tie in with, uh, with kind of um, dedications of um, those sorts of victory monuments. Have you um, ever, ever come across Mary Renault? She, yeah. she describes this as part of a, the Mask of Apollo that I was using just last uh-huh. week. Uh, uh-huh. and, and she, I mean, ob- obviously she's... But she interprets it through her character as being the face of Apollo, and you know, like like a stone doesn't care if it trips you up if you're too stupid to tread on it. Apollo, Apollo will support you if you're a fabulous actor, but he'll dump you as soon as you're no good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've looking at the hand, the holes the back. Do you know what the holes? So again, we think some kind of bonds okay. uh, attachment, um, possibly um, kind of the a clasp or something like yeah. that, which is attaching the belt together. Um, yeah, and then we've only got kind of five minutes left or so. So I just, the other one I just wanted to sort of alert you to was thinking about copies and the problem of copies because so much of Greek freestanding sculpture we are kind of interpreting through Roman copies rather than through the original. So we have got some originals, we've got the Delta Charity, we've got the Riachi bronzes, but a lot of what the kind of canonical pieces like the Colitis is Doriferous, um, the 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 Gardumenas, these sorts of statues we only have through through copies. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that the way that scholars kind of decide what these ancient Greek statues look like is they essentially, when they found a number of statues that are talked about in ancient texts, um, and they found lots of replicas of a particular type, they assume that that type goes back to one of the statues that's talked about in the texts. Um, So with Polyclitus, there's a lot of debate as to whether, um, so Polyclitus is known to have made a uh, Diadumenos and a Doriferous, those are the statues in that passage by Pliny. Um, and Pliny also says he made a statue the artists called the Canon, which uh, basically embodied his ideal proportions for the human body. Um, and then the debate is whether or not the Doriferous is the Canon or whether the two things were separate. So some people think that the Canon is a literary work and then the Doriferous just sort of put it into action, so to speak. Um, but all of this talk uh, from the kind of Roman text is very much about it as almost like a, an artwork in its own sake. Whereas it's maybe, I would argue, much more likely that the statue itself wasn't just a deriferous, but was a statue of a particular individual set up in a particular sanctuary to commemorate a particular victory or something like that. So that we've kind of lost some of the specifics of the context because of that, the, 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 the history really. Um, but just to, to uh, one nice example of its fame in the Roman period is that the head, um, so the Doriferous itself, spear carrier, um, or even if it's the canon, it's kind of ideal proportions, you sort of need the whole body to be able to tell that. But in the Roman period, it does get exerted as well. So you get this bust, which we've got on the left hand side there, um, which comes from the Bill of the Papari at Herculaneum. Um, where it's a very faithful replica of the face of the Doriferous. And presumably you're supposed to recognise that and know that that is a famous artwork. Um, but actually the inscription doesn't mention Polyclitus at all. The inscription says that Apollonius made it, some other sculptor. So it's also that sculptors are proud of their ability to kind of copy earlier pieces of, of Greek art. Um, and then I just gave you a couple of the sort of two images of the Diadumenos. Um, of Polyclitus, just to show you that actually, you know, these two statues, they're both supposed to be copies of, of Polyclitus Diadumenos, which is um, a boy, so it's, this is these two, um, tying a fillet around his head, but they look quite different, you know, the mm-hmm. arms are quite different, the stance is rather different, there's much more movement in the one on the left, um, so this is the one on the left, I should have said, this one from Delos, one of the writers in the British Museum. Um, and um, also the bases um, of, so these ones have both look like um, pine uh, trees, but have uh, got palms on them. But sometimes you also get bases that look more like um, 
uh, trees, for example. So we don't know, you know, you can't always tell what the context of the original statue was, or whether it was an athlete or a god or who it was supposed to, to represent. Um, and then I just gave you the copy of Praxiteles as Aphrodite as well, um, because that's another one that we we don't really, um, so we don't have the original, but we have coins that show her, we have lots of literary texts that talk about her, uh, clearly a very famous statue, but there's, there's still quite a lot of kind of unknowns about exactly how she was displayed. Um, so there's one reconstruction is that she was displayed in a, an open shrine, and the other one is that she was displayed in a kind of rectangular temple, the entrance at the front and the back. Um, and we've got literary testimonies for both of those. So, yeah, that's just a sort of cautionary tale, I suppose. <laughs> so, there's something so fascinating as well about the replica, because the narrative yeah. is that the Romans copied and they copied in marble, and there's Greek sort of bronze originals, mm -hmm. which is a real weird thing, because if you're going to copy, in terms of practicality, it's actually way easier to copy in bronze. You just cast parts of it. Yeah. Whereas marble, in terms of labor and skill, is much, much harder. Although it's probably a cheaper resource, but it's a really interesting yeah. problem there. And you can't do kind of mechanical copying in marble at all. Really. I mean, you yeah. can measure yeah. in to, and some some of them do have these um, Quintelli little marks on the, the, the marble, which suggest that they've sort of measured to a particular point on the statue and then sort of carved around it. Um, which in some cases seem to be left deliberately to show you that they've been trying to do an <laughs> accurate replica. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. And there's also, what's quite nice, in the cast museum in the Ashmolean, they've got a, a, a plaster cast of the uh, Diadum, no, the Discobolos, mine's Discobolos, but without the support. And they painted it bronze, so they've almost tried to, they've like done a cast of a Roman copy, but taken away the sport and painted it bronze to try and get back to look like what the original would have looked nice. like. So, um, Elephant C in the body, the kind of the, the Elephant C in the body, the kind of the, the 